thanks so much, and welcome, everyone. Last month, I traveled to China to meet with writers, editors, and publishers who are working under the heavy pressures of Beijing's censorship and repression. One of the most startling takeaways from the trip was the extent to which, despite the internet, despite cell phones, despite social media, the Chinese are succeeding in controlling the flow of information to their population of 1.3 billion people. One of the starkest examples of that control is the enforced collective amnesia regarding critical events in Chinese history. We spoke to a 30-year-old Oxford PhD student who told us that none of his peers know that the Tiananmen Square massacre even happened. They can't read about it, they don't study it, and their parents have learned not to talk about it with them. The same is true of the Great Famine that occurred during the Cultural Revolution. 30 million people starved to death, but the Chinese history books don't discuss it, and the leading historical account, a book called Tombstone by the writer Yang Jicheng, cannot be published in China. When I got home from China, I told all this to my 10-year-old son, Leo. His question was, how do we know what secrets our government is keeping from us? How do we know what secrets our government is keeping from us? Well, the Guantanamo Diary is the story of a secret our own government has been keeping from us. It's hidden in plain sight. We know about the detainees, we know about torture, and yet this book shocks us. We know, yet we don't know. When you work at Penn, you get asked about the connection between human rights and literature. We can read newspaper accounts, congressional testimony, human rights reports, and I'm for all that. Yet until we read a work of literature, something that moves us, that we can't put down, that we can't ignore, until then, the government secrets are still safe. On behalf of Penn American Center, we could not be prouder of Larry Seams, the editor of this book. Larry is the former director of Penn's Freedom to Write program, which he led for more than 17 years. Larry has done, in a powerful way, what has eluded all of us as advocates over so long. He has brought a Guantanamo detainee on shore to our living rooms, our nightstands, and our dinner tables. And he's done it in Mahmoudou Aslahi's own words. Penn has something called the Free Word Festival that we put on all over the world. Larry has freed the word. He's created an antidote to amnesia and shared secrets that can never be secret again. Thank you. I wanted to start by thanking our co-hosts at Penn, the readers you'll be hearing from tonight, and all of you who are here to mark the release of Mohamedou's Guantanamo diary. Of course, it should be Mohamedou standing here today telling all of us his full story, uncensored by the government that tortured and continues to detain him unlawfully. Until that day happens though, and we are fighting to make sure his release comes soon, we have the gift of his words. When I first read Mohamedou's words, when I had access to them back in 2012, I was reminded of other words that became a mantra in the corridors of power in Washington, D.C., around the exact same time that Mohamedou was writing his diary. Senator John McCain, who knows about torture, having been subjected to it himself, said at a time when our nation was debating whether we should loosen the restrictions formally on torture, it's not about them, it's about us. The notion being that us were the people who don't torture and shouldn't torture, and them were the people who challenge our decision not to torture. 
Mahamadou's book, I think, complicates that narrative, hopefully irrevocably. In a place devoted to dehumanizing them, Mohamedou and other prisoners like him, Mohamedou instead humanizes those who were asked to represent us, his American torturers and jailers, in an effort to understand why they did what they would do. At a time when torture was United States official policy, one of our nation's victims tried to understand not just why, but with what consequences. You'll hear tonight some of the impact of the torture on Mohamedou. And at a time when our debate about torture has been too much about its effectiveness, I hope you will be unsurprised to be reminded that there are only two things that torture guarantees, pain and false information. Mohamedou's account is one that is remarkable for many reasons. For me, I think it's remarkable because it is one conveyed with extraordinary grace, humanity, hope, and even humor. He tries to understand and describe what happens when a nation asks its soldiers to try and break the minds and bodies of their fellow human beings. He comes to think of his kinder guards as his family at the same time that he remembers and longs for every day the family that he left behind, the family that is still waiting for him to come home. Tonight, I think, Mohamedou of all people would like us not only to think of him as we hear his words spoken, but also of the men he calls his brothers, his fellow prisoners who still languish with him at Guantanamo. There are 122 men still there. 54 of them have been cleared for release for years. Part of the hope that I think this book brings is the fact that it has become a bestseller here and is becoming a bestseller in other parts of the world. I think that gives a lie to the view that Americans don't care about Guantanamo or about the people who are held there. This book's writing and its publication reflects one man's faith in all of us, his fellow human beings, that once we know his story, we will help to end the injustice that it reflects and the injustice that continues to hold Mohamedou and so many others still at Guantanamo. And I hope you will think about that and join us as we work hard to secure his release and end and close Guantanamo. Thank you for coming. July, two thousand, okay. July 2002 to February 2003. An escort team appeared in redacted in front of my cell. 760 reservation, they said. Okay, just give me a second. I put my clothes on and washed my face. My heart started to pound. I hated interrogation. I had gotten tired of being terrified all the time living in constant fear day in and day out for the last 13 months. Allah be with you, keep your head on, they work for Satan, yelled my fellow detainees to keep me together, as we always did when somebody got pulled for interrogation. I hated the sounds of the heavy metal chains. I can hardly carry them when they're given me. People were always getting taken from the block and every time I heard the chains, I thought it would be me. You never know what's going to happen in, in the interrogation. People sometimes never came back to the block. They just disappeared. It happened to a Moroccan fellow detainee, and it will happen to me, as you're going to learn, God willing. When I entered the room in redacted, it was crowded with redacted. Hi, hi. I've chosen redacted. Based on their experience and maturity, they'll be assessing your case from now on. There are a couple of things that need to be completed in your case. For instance, you didn't tell us everything about Redacted. He's a very important guy. First, 
I told you what I know about Redacted, even though I don't need to be providing you information about anybody. We're talking here about me. I need you to answer me one question. Why am I here? If you don't give me the answer, you can consider me a non-existent detainee. Later on, I learned from my great lawyers, Redacted, that the magic formulation of my request is a petition for a writ of habeas corpus. Obviously, that phrase makes no sense to the average mortal man like me. The average person would just say, why the hell are you locking me up? I'm not a lawyer, but common sense dictates that after three years of interrogating me and depriving me of my liberty, the government at least owes me an explanation of why it's doing so. What exactly is my crime? July 2002 to February 2003. It says in the Quran that somebody who kills one soul is considered to have killed all humanity, said the French translator, trying to reach a breakthrough. I looked at him disrespectfully with the side of my face. I'm not the guy you're looking for, I said in French, and I repeated it in plain English. Redacted started. I'm sure you're against killing people. We're not looking for you. We're looking for those guys who are out there trying to hurt innocents. He said this while showing me a bunch of ghostly pictures. I refused to look at them. And whenever he tried to put them under my sight, I looked somewhere else. I didn't even want to give him the satisfaction of having taken a look at them. Look, Redacted is cooperating, and he has a good chance of getting his sentence reduced to 27 years. And Redacted is a really bad person. Somebody like you needs only talk for five minutes, and you're a free man, said Redacted. He was everything but reasonable. When I contemplate his contemplated his statement, I was like, God, a guy who is cooperating is going to be locked up for 27 more years? After which he won't be able to enjoy any kind of life. What kind of harsh country is that? You could tell that the interrogators were getting used to detainees who refused to cooperate after having cooperated for a while. Just as I was learning from other detainees how not to cooperate, the interrogators were learning from each other how to deal with non-cooperating detainees. The session was closed, and I was sent back to my cell. I was satisfied with myself. Since now, I officially belong to the majority, the non-cooperating detainees. I minded less being locked up unjustly for the rest of my life. What drove me crazy was to be expected to cooperate, too. You lock me up, I give you no information, and we are both cool. He once said, still, because we're Americans, we treat you guys according to our high standards. Look at Redacted. We're offering him the latest medical technology. You want to keep him alive because he might have some intels. And if he dies, they're going to die with him, I responded. July 2002 to February 2003. Bring me to the court, and I'll answer all your questions, I would tell the team. There will be no court, they would answer. Are you a mafia? You kidnap people, lock them up, and blackmail them, I said. You guys are a law enforcement problem, said Redacted. We cannot apply the conventional law to you. We need only circumstantial evidence to try you. I've done nothing against your country, have I? You're a part of the big conspiracy against the US, said Redacted. You can pull this charge on anybody. What have I done? I don't know, you tell me. Look, you kidnapped me from my home in Mauritania, not from a battlefield in Afghanistan, because you suspect me of having been part of the Millennium Plot, which I am not, as you know by now. So what's the next charge? It looks to me as if you want to pull any shit on me. I don't want to pull any shit on you. I just wish you had access to the same reports as I do, said Redacted. <laughs> I don't care what the reports say. I'd just like you to take a look at the reports from January 2000 linking me to the Millennium Plot, and you now know that I'm not a part of it after the cooperation of Redacted. 
I don't think that you are a part of it, nor do I believe that you know Redacted, but I do know that you know people who know Redacted, <laughs> said Redacted. <laughs> I don't know, but I don't see the problem if it is the case, I replied. Knowing somebody is not a crime, no matter who he is. Uh, February 2003 to August 2003. According to my experience, you will cooperate. <laughs> Look, we're stronger than you and have more resources, Going said. Going never wanted me to know his name, but he got busted when one of his colleagues mistakenly called him by his name. He doesn't know that I know it, but well, I do. Going grew worse with every day passing by. He started to lay out my case. He began with the story of eh, and me having recruited him for the September 11th attack. Why should he lie to us? Going said, well, I don't know. All, I, all you have to say is, I don't remember, I don't know, I've done nothing. You think you're going to impress an American jury with these words? In the eyes of the Americans, you're, you're doomed. Just looking at you in an orange suit, chains, and being Muslim and Arabic is enough to convict you. Well, that is unjust. But we know that you are a criminal. <laughs> what have I done? Well, you tell me. Otherwise, you'll never see the light of day. If you don't cooperate, well, we're going to put you in a hole and wipe your name out of our detainee database. I was so terrified because I knew that even though he couldn't make much much a decision of, on his own. He had the complete backup of a high government level. He didn't speak from thin air. I don't care where you take me, just, just do it. I figured I wouldn't degrade myself and lower myself to his level, so I didn't answer him. When I failed to give him the answer he wanted to hear, he made me stand up with my back bent because my hands were shackled to my feet and waist and locked to the floor. Doing, turned the temperature control all the way down and made sure that the guards maintained me in that situation until, until he decided otherwise. He used to start a fuss before going to lunch so he could keep me hurt during his lunch which took at least two or three hours. Going likes his food. He never missed his lunch. I always wondered how Going could possibly have passed the Army's fitness test. <laughs> but I realized, oh, he was in the Army for a reason. He was good at being inhumane. The torture was growing day by day. The guards on the block actively participated in the process. The redacted tell them what to do with the, with the detainees when they come back to the block. I had guards banging on my cell to prevent me from sleeping. They cursed me for no reason. They repeatedly woke me, unless my interrogators decided to give me a break. I never complained to my interrogators about the issue because I knew they planned it with the guards. As promised, Redacted pulled me early in the day. Lonely in my cell, I was terrified when I heard the guards carrying the heavy chains and shouting at my door, reservation. My heart started to pound heavily because I always expected the worst. But the fact that I wasn't allowed to see the light made me enjoy the short trip between my freaking cold cell and the interrogation room. 
It was just a blessing when the warm Gitmo sun hit me. I felt life sneaking back into every inch of my body. I would always get this fake happiness, though only for a very short time. It's like taking narcotics. How have you been? said one of the Puerto Rican escorting guards in his weak English. I'm okay, thanks. You? No worry, you're gonna get back to your family, he said. When he said that I couldn't, when he said that, I couldn't help breaking in redacted. Lately I'd become so vulnerable. What was wrong with me? Just one soothing word in this ocean of agony was enough to make me cry. Redacted, we had a complete Puerto Rican division. They were different than other Americans. They were not as vigilant or unfriendly. Sometimes they took detainees to shower redacted. Everyone liked them, but they got in trouble with those responsible for the camps because of their friendly and humane approach to the detainees. I can't objectively speak about the people of Puerto Rico because I haven't met enough. However, if you ask me, have you ever seen a bad Puerto Rican guy? My answer would be no. February 2003 to August 2003. The new redacted pulled the metal chair away and left me on the floor. Now tell us about redacted. No, that's passe, I said. Yes, you're right. So if it is passe, talk about it. It won't hurt, the new re redacted said. No. Then today we're going to teach you about great American sex. Get up, said redacted. I stood up in the same painful position as I had every day for about 70 days. I would rather follow the orders and reduce the pain that would be caused when the gods came to play. The gods used every contact opportunity to beat the hell out of the detainee. Detainee tried to resist was the gospel truth they came up with. And guess who was going to be believed? You're very smart because if you don't stand up, it's going to be ugly, redacted. As soon as I stood up, two redacted took off their blouses and started to talk all kind of dirty stuff you can imagine, which I minded less. What hurt me most was them forcing me to take part in the sexual threesome in the most degrading manner. What many redacted don't realize is that men get hurt the same as women if they're forced to have sex, maybe more due to the traditional position of the man. Both redacted stuck on me, literally one on the front and the other older redacted stuck on my back rubbing redacted whole body on mine. At the same time, they were talking dirty to me and playing with my sexual pots. I am saving you here from quoting the disgusting and degrading talk I had to listen to from noon or before until 10 p.m. when they turned me over to Redacted, the new character you'll soon meet. I was just wishing to pass out so I didn't have to suffer, and that was really the main reason for my hunger strike. I knew people like these don't get impressed by hunger strikes. Of course, they didn't want me to die, but they understood there are many steps before one dies. You're not going to die. We're going to feed you up your ass, said Redacted. February 2003 to August 2003. I have never felt as violated in myself as I had since the DOD team started to torture me to get me to admit things I haven't done. You, dear reader, could never understand the extent of the physical and much more the psychological pain people in my situation suffered. No matter how hard you try to put yourself in another's shoes, had I done, what they accused me of, I would have relieved myself on day one. But the problem is that you cannot just admit to something you haven't done. You need to deliver the details, which when you can't, when you hadn't done anything, it's not just, yes, I did. No, it doesn't work that way. You have to make a com up a complete story that makes sense to the dumbest dummies. <laughs> One of the hardest things to do is tell an untruthful story and maintain it, and that is exactly where I was stuck. Of course, I didn't want to involve myself in devastating crimes I hadn't done, especially under the present circumstances where the U.S. government was jumping on every Muslim and trying to pin any crime on him. 
We're going to do this with you every single day, day in, day out, unless you speak about Redacted and admit your crimes, said Redacted. You have to provide us a smoking gun about another friend of yours, something that would really help you, Redacted said in a later session. Why should you take all of this if you can stop it? Humiliation, sexual harassment, Fear and starvation was the order of the day until around 10 p.m. Interrogators made sure that I had no clue about the time, but nobody is perfect. Their watches always revealed it. I would be using this mistake later when they put me in, the, in dark isolation. I'm going to send you to your cell now, and tomorrow you'll experience even worse, said Redacted, after consulting with Redacted colleagues. I was happy to be relieved. I just wanted to have a break and be left alone. I was so worn out, and only God knew how I looked. February 2003 to, two, to August 2003. Bring the motherfucker back, shouted Redacted. A celebrity among the torture squad, he was about redacted, about six feet tall, athletically built, and redacted. Redacted was aware that he was committing heavy war crimes, and so he was ordered by his bosses to cover himself. But if there is any kind of basic justice, he will get busted through his bosses. We know their names and their ranks. When I got to know Redacted more and heard him speaking, I wondered how could a man as smart as he possibly accept such a degrading job, which surely is going to haunt him for the rest of his life. For the sake of fairness and honesty, I must say that Redacted spoke convincingly to me. Although he had no information and was completely misled, Maybe he had a few choices because many people in the army come from poor families and that's why the army sometimes gives them the dirtiest job. I mean, theoretically, Redacted could have refused to commit crimes of war and he might even get away with it. Later on, I discussed with some of my guards why they executed the order to stop me from praying. Since it's, un since it's, an, un un since it's an unlawful, unlawful order. The room was as dark as ebony. Redacted started playing a track very loudly. I mean, very loudly. The song was, Let the Bodies Hit the Floor. I might never forget that song. At the same time, Redacted turned on some colored blinkers that hurt the eyes. If you fucking fall asleep, I'm going to hurt you, he said. I had to listen to the song over and over until the next morning. I started praying. Stop the fucking praying, he said loudly. I was by this time both really tired and terrified, so I decided to pray in my heart. Every once in a while, Redacted gave me water. I drank the water because I was only scared of being hurt. I really had no feeling for time. To the best of my knowledge, Redacted sent me back to my cell around 5 a.m. in the morning. Welcome to hell, said Redacted. And the guard, when I stepped inside the block, I, I didn't answer. And Redacted really wasn't worth it anyways. But I was like, I think you deserve hell more than I do because you're working dutifully to get there. So can you tell us a little bit, Nancy, the story of how this manuscript ended up being the book that we were hearing these incredible readings from tonight, because you were the vehicle. Well, I can tell you how it started. It started in 2005 when I first met Mohamedou. A, a lawyer in, in France sent me an email, a lawyer who I knew from some teaching, and said the family and a lawyer in Mauritania have asked me to, to see if we can represent this young man who they think is still in Guantanamo. And I found that he was there, and I found that actually he had been assigned a lawyer by the Center for Constitutional Rights, but she'd never met him, 
Her name was Sylvia Royce, and she worked with us at that time. She later left the team. But I talked to Sylvia, and we decided that we would go together to visit him. And I wrote him a letter, but I had no way of knowing if he'd received the letter. So on our first trip to Guantanamo, Sylvia and I met in the airport in Fort Lauderdale, and we took the, the little airplane down, the little, at that time, it was a little 10-seater plane. It took three and a half hours, no bathroom. Um, they lined everybody up before we went and said, there are the men's bathrooms and there's the women's, and everyone should use them because you're going to be on this plane for three and a half hours. And we flew. You can't fly from Fort Lauderdale straight to over Cuban airspace, so we had to fly all the way around and come up the back. And we got to Guantanamo, and we got out to the prison. You have to take a little ferry to get to the prison. It's on the other side of the island. And we went into the little hut where they were having the attorney meetings, and we walked in, and there was this young man standing there, and he stood up. And um, he was sitting when we walked in, and he stood up, and he put his arms out like this. But he didn't move. And we stood there for a minute, and then we realized that he wanted to embrace us. He was smiling, but he was shackled to the floor with an eye bolt around his ankle. And so he couldn't move. And we just walked into his embrace, and that was my first meeting. He stood and held us the first people he had touched who were not guards and interrogators in four years. And then we spent two days with him, and he, the, the guards had given him a notebook, a little green notebook, and he had written 90 pages. And he wrote it originally so that we would know something about him, because in fact he did get my letter and he knew we were coming, so he'd written what was the beginning of the story, and he wrote it originally so we would know something about him. And then he just kept writing. And he wrote, eventually, 466 pages by the end of that year that came up to us. And that was how this book began. And was there, was there any attempt uh, to keep you from getting this book? I mean, did they know what would, had it been read by them before you saw no. it? Uh, were you allowed to fly away with it? Uh, how did it go from that, the story of this incredible manuscript that was being, and he wrote it in English also. He, he wrote it in English, which is his fourth language. Which he learned entirely in captivity? Well, he knew some English before he went there, but his English has really progressed, and actually, if you read the whole book, you can see his English progress in the 400 pages, and I've seen it get better over 10 years. But um, but he already spoke uh, and was fluent in Arabic, French, and German. And then he learned English. But the way it works in Guantanamo is everything that he says is presumed to be classified. Even if he says what he wants me to bring him for lunch from the McDonald's, it's presumed to be classified. But what he provides for his lawyers is privileged, attorney-client privilege. So he gives it to me, and this still happens to this day. He writes something, and it either he either sends it to Washington, to a place near Washington, or gives it to counsel when we go. It gets sealed up and goes to this place that's near Washington, and that's where it stays in its classified or presumed classified form, and that's where it was for years, and that was the fight we had for six years because we continued to argue that it was part of our advocacy for, for the people to see it, for the press to see it, for the court of public opinion to see it, that that's part of my job as a lawyer is for people to know about this. The government had a different idea, which was that it should stay secret. And so we fought and fought, and we finally had to give up the attorney-client privilege for them to then send it back to God knows wherever they sent it. And it took another two years. And it came back in a form that's called protected, which is kind of a made-up form. It's not exactly classified because I can talk about it to my legal team. We can share it. We can read it. But I can't show it to you or anyone else. And so we had another <coughs> fight, and I said, you know, we didn't give up the privilege so that you could read everything he wrote. 
We gave it up so that the public could read it. It went back, it took another year. Finally, in, in I think it was September, may have been earlier, in 2012, I received a package from the government with the 466 pages redacted and a letter saying, this is the form in which you can release it. So that was the story of how it finally got out in 2012, and then the story becomes Larry's. And how did, how did it come to you, Larry, and not to the press in general all at once, or how, how did you go about I dealing was, with it? I was very lucky. When was, was the first time you met him? Well, I haven't met him. Have I still have met, not met him. I haven't spoken with him. Um, in the summer, I think it was the summer, late summer of 2012, I got a phone call from Hina um, saying that we had this manuscript and it's been cleared for public release and would I like to look at it. And I knew ab about three reasons why I would like to read it by that time. Um, one was because I, I knew basically what had happened to Mohamedou. I knew the story of his interrogation in Guantanamo, it, it, his whole odyssey even before he got to Guantanamo where he was picked up, disappeared basically from his home in Mauritania, flown to Amman, Jordan, interrogated by the Jordanians for about seven months. Then a CIA, another CIA rendition flight picks him up, takes him to Bagram, and then he gets delivered to, to, to Guantanamo. And then in Guantanamo, he's one of two so-called special projects interrogations whose um, torture was signed off on by Donald Rumsfeld. Um, it was part of a meticulously crafted interrogation plan. Uh, and that plan was written down. <coughs> and then in the strange way of torturers um, throughout history, it was meticulously documented in its implementation. So every day the interrogators would keep their memoranda for the record describing what they had done. And by 2009, we had all of that information. There were two major reports that were re released in 2008. One was by the Department of Justice, that report arose because the FBI was so incensed about the, the, what was happening in Guantanamo. And you saw, you know, the, you had got a sense from that little film of this kind of in incredible struggle that some men and women fought inside of the detention facilities to stop torture. Um, and so the DOJ had done this big report about FBI complaints about torture in Guantanamo. And the Senate Armed Services Committee had done an, a report about detainee abuse in Guantanamo, Afghanistan, and Iraq. And both of those reports have multi-page sections about what, happens, what happened to Mohamed Udslahi in, in Guantanamo. Um, and so I knew that that had to be interesting. I knew he had this incredible journey. And I also had just a couple little samples of his voice. They had, in among all the documents, they had released transcripts from his 2004 and 2005 review board hearings, and you got a sense of his sense of humor. He describes this guard who we heard about in the reading, or the interrogator, I'm sorry, who was masked, and you know, he said he was, he was covered from head to toe in black, like the way Saudi women in Saudi Arabia are dressed, and he had O.J. Simpson gloves on his hands, you know? <laughs> so you got little things like that. And in 2005, he's, he actually, at his hearing, he starts to tell the story of his abuse, and quite miraculously, there's a note in boldface type that the accord recording equipment malfunctioned just as he starts to tell his story. So you don't get the whole thing, but he comes back and at the very end he says, I just want to mention that I wrote a book recently while in jail here about my whole story, okay? I sent it for release to the District of Columbia and when it is released, he's saying this to the presiding officers of his hearing, and when it is rele released, I advise you to read it. It's a very interesting book, I think. <laughs> And I, that was released in 2006, so I knew that there was this manuscript. I knew it had to be an incredible story. I had no idea what I was going to get when I when I got this call in 2012, and what a wonder it is. Have you been when you went about being the editor of this and turning it into the book that it is now? I mean, obviously the manuscript is what it is, but you have this elaborate uh, apparatus of notes and a lot of knowledge that you've wrapped around it and put through it. Were you in any kind of communication with him? Were you even in communication with each other during this process? We really weren't. I mean, I... Because you'd read what was under the black lines. Right. So I actually never read Larry's introduction or any of the footnotes, nor did any of his other cleared lawyers, lawyers who had security clearance, until that book was published. So we couldn't have that communication. I couldn't, cor I couldn't talk to him. I couldn't correspond with him. When I had completed a draft edit of the manuscript, I officially petitioned the Pentagon to, be al to allow me to meet with him when just once because 
as a longtime free expression advocate and writer's rights advocate, I kind of feel like it's the most basic right of a writer to be able to have say over how his or her work appears in print. And so I just said, I will do whatever security protocols you want. You know, I just want to have one meeting with him to, to go through the manuscript to make sure I've got this right. And they sent me back the same message that they send every single writer and journalist who's ever petitioned to speak to a Guantanamo detainee, which is say, to say, as you know, the only people who can speak to Guantanamo detainees, detainees are their attorneys who have full security clearances. And moreover, you know, uh, we, citing the Geneva Conventions, uh, additionally, we do not make we, we do not make the prisoners into public curiosities, <laughs> you know. And it's just you know, as, uh, their 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 relationship to the Geneva Conventions in Mohamedou's case was loose at best. <laughs> um, but that's the, that is the blanket excuse that they continue to deliver to this day. No writer and no journalist has ever spoken, communicated with a uh, prisoner in Guantanamo, and yet he's now spoken to. Us. He has book. he has this absolutely undeniable voice. You know, you start reading this thing, and you just, you know, you're in the. Uh, suddenly, you're there, and you you understand what this experience means, not just for him, but and not just for prisoners, but for the men and women who are in that position as well. And I think you know, for me, that was you know, I, I was I went through this sort of process of learning to trust him as a storyteller. I mean, I had this whole outline of the story thanks to the government's own documents. So I could say when they, you know, when he describes let the bodies hit the floor, like put, put in a cold room and the strobe lights go on, we know what date that happened because we have the memoranda for the record that they're, they're quoted in the Senate Intelligence or the Senate Armed Services Committee report. So, you know, for the, the first read through, it's just like this guy has an unbelievable memory and he's an unbelievably accurate storyteller. And then there's just like the scope of his story is so amazing. But th the thing that you don't expect is his incredible humanity, his incredible sense of irony, his sense of humor, uh, his ability to capture character. He's constantly being drawn outside of himself the way any good writer is. So, you know, uh, one of the first moments where I thought this is going to be very interesting was very early on, the first scene, you know, he's renditioned to Bagram and then he's flown to Guantanamo and you know the, the flight is a 30 hour flight in a freezing cold airplane from, from Bagram to, to Guantanamo. They, they land in Guantanamo, they pile the guys, they just throw them into trucks, they're all bound and shackled. They kind of pile them on top of each other and they're, ye you know, he's in this truck and the guards are yelling at him, shut up, sit down, you know, no talking. And then the one guard says no talking and another guard says do not talk. And in the middle of that he says, Oh, they give the same order two different ways. That's interesting, <laughs> you know. And it's just like that, you know, what that kind of curiosity, where even in that most extreme moment, it was, you know, fascination with language. It was a sense of who's who am I with? How do they speak? You know, that just carried through the whole book. Which came first, the order that he should be released, the original decision that there really was nothing on him, or the decision to clear the book uh, in the form that we've seen it? Well, the, the order to release him came first. Uh, we filed, the, the habeas was filed in 2005, and a lot of things happened. They weren't allowed to file habeas for a while. Then the court shifted, and then they went forward. And we had a hearing in 2009. And he testified at that hearing through a video link. Linda Marino, who's here, was with him, and Teresa Duncan and the other lawyers, Jonathan Heifetz and I, were in Washington. And so he was testifying, and the judge heard him uh, over the course of two days and made a ruling. This was Judge Robertson, the first really neutral person to look at the evidence. And by this time, he'd already been in for nine years, and the government had nine years to gather evidence against him. And Judge Robertson said, you don't have it, and ordered him released. And that was in 2010. Um, the government appealed. It was the Obama administration. They made a conscious decision to appeal these cases to try to convince the Court of Appeals to have a looser standard, which they did. So the case went back to the district court where it sits. In the middle of all that, we were still arguing about the book. We kept arguing about the book. Now, you've got to understand, the government had never read it because we had it, and it was a privileged document. It was in this vault in Washington. 
Um, but we kept fighting that, and it was two years later that we finally got the book out. And the case still sits there. We've never made any progress on the case. What made you decide to, once you had the book out, not to wait to get it out the way it came out, rather than, I mean, one can imagine, from the, from the, especially from a lawyer advocate's point of view, maybe you'd have thought better to have uh, five big pieces in the New York Times and a big CNN special on it, and then the book comes a year later. What made you decide, I want this whole thing out there? That's what the client wanted. Huh. Um, Mohamedou wanted this book as a book. And he trusted me, and he told, I can't tell you what he told me, but. <laughs> Redacted. Redacted. But he said. He, he did sign a, a document, and I can tell you what that document said, because it was cleared, and the document said that I was responsible for anything he wrote, and that it would be my obligation to get it out. Uh, but I knew that what he wanted was it out in the form that the most people would see it, and in the form that retained his voice. And that, that was very important to him, that his voice be retained, uh, that it not just be a journalist writing about something he wrote. There had been articles about that, and we had actually released a couple letters. Um, there was a wonderful letter that we released That's very good. early on. Um, and he actually was kind of angry at me because um, I, I was trying to kind of help him have something to do. You know, every day is the same for him. And so I wrote to him and said, I can tell you what I said. I wrote to him and said, uh, why don't you just write down everything your interrogators have been asking you? And the letter we got back, which we did get cleared, so I can tell you what it says, he said, you know, you can't ask me to write everything that my interrogators have asked me. That's like asking Charlie Sheen how many girlfriends he's had. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just classic Mohamedou. But it's his voice that we, that Larry was required to retain. And that's what he wanted. Mm -hmm. So that was my task and that's what we did. And in your dealings with him, um, I mean there's, we're laughing a certain amount here. There's a, something about his voice that is available to us. It's not acute. I mean, we're all profoundly implicated in what our government's been yes. doing to these people, and yet he's somehow managed to present us with a feel-good horror story. And I'm trying to figure <laughs> out the feel-good part, because he's still there, and yet there's something so incredibly likable about him, and not uh, directly embittered or accusatory in his tone, that I'm wondering, I mean, where's that humor coming from in him? Um, is there actually humor in this situation? Does he think it's, does he have hope of getting out still? Does he see it that way? Does he see this as uh, somehow he's canny enough that he's figured out that getting this book out there will help him? Do you think it will help him? I hope it will help him. That was the whole idea of this book. And all I really care about is his <coughs> going home. Much more than I care about the book, rea it really. Mm -hmm. Most important is to get him out. Um, and we all share that. but. You know, he has this ability, as Larry says, to get outside of himself and sometimes to go inside himself and to just block out the world. And he, he's just a very gentle person. He is a funny person. He's very smart. He's empathetic. And he is well-liked. I mean, if you read the book, you see that guards have given him some books and written in them. And this is unheard of among the, the prisoners as far as I know. He's a very special individual. And I, but on the other hand, there's a fragility to him and he's been damaged. There's no question that there's his, he's mentally has had some damage as a result of what he went through. And some of that we won't really know until he's out because that's when when he has to deal with life on a day-to-day -day basis or has to be in a room, in a dark room by himself or has to travel somewhere that will know how badly damaged we have created him. Is he, I guess I'm wondering, like, is he still writing? He writes letters and he does still write. If you look at the very end of this book, the, um, what does it say, the note from an author, I believe, that's something he wrote actually when Linda was with him in 2014. Um, 
and he had actually written something longer, but this is what we were able to get cleared. And it's just, it's so classic of Muhammadu that he says, you know, when I get out, I just would like to sit down and have a cup of tea with these people because we've learned so much from each other. And that's who he is. And yes, he, he certainly still writes letters. We received a letter today. I mean, I didn't exactly receive a letter. What I received was an email from the privilege team in Washington saying, you have received a letter. What would you like us to do with it? And the answer was, put it in our drawer, and somebody from Washington will go read it and see whether we want it clear. But we get letters from him all the time. They take about a month to come to us, and our letters take about a month to get to him. So it's not a very good process. We don't get phone calls. He doesn't get visits from his family. It's not like a regular prison at all. And, it, and if he's out, is he allowed to fill in all the blanks? I mean, I mean, you know, I, th I think you can look at his story as a story of censorship of his life and experience. I mean, this is a censorship story. The Guantanamo is a censorship story. It was created as with censorship as part of its DNA. <laughs> Secrecy was necessary in order to violate the treaties and laws that we violated with torture. And then secrecy was an essential to cover up the fact that we did those things. And secrecy has been essential to, you know, sort of forestall the ultimate reckoning for those things. So, you know, that's been built into it. And, and you know, here's a, here, this is a man's experience, which is a record of, you know, massive human mistakes and really gross criminal misconduct. And there was a long, you know, the part of the censorship of this manuscript was a, a deliberate attempt to suppress that. I think one of the reasons it was finally released in 2012 was that most of the information about his treatment had been declassified already. So the government could no longer say that his own account of his, exper of his experience was a state secret, which is essentially what they were saying up until that point. So, you know, the redactions that are still in the book are like the the last fingerprints of this, you know, pervasive censorship re regime. When he's out, uh, he gets to tell his story. I mean, I think that's, you know, that's something that we should look forward to. You went to Nuwakchot to, to Mauritania. I didn't. I visited his brother in Germany. You visited his brother in Germany. Had American press gone and talked to his family? That's an amazing. I mean, where, where are, are we doing our job here? I think this is a really amazing story because you think about censorship of Guantanamo, and you know we put agency on the government. This was a government-imposed censorship regime, but you know it's really interesting. The more you spend time with a story like this, to realize how much this, the citizens of this country have self-censored, how much we've drawn a curtain in our own minds around this subject. So. Mohammedu's youngest brother, Yadi, lives in Dusseldorf. He's a German citizen. You know, Mohammedu went to Germany and lived and worked there as an electrical engineer for 10 years. He was the breadwinner for an enormous family, has 11 brothers and sisters. Um, when he, you know, Yadi followed in his footsteps. Yadi is now playing that role. Um, he's a public person. He speaks uh, publicly about his brother's case. He has never been interviewed by an American journalist the entire time since his brother disappeared. And I went and visited him last year, and I heard this story um, about his disappearance, which we knew. We knew that he, he had driven himself to the police station, and we'd sent a rendition plane. But we never, nobody ever asked what that would mean to a family, right? So Yadi tells the story. He, he drove himself. He was told, come, be questioned. We're gonna drive your own car. You'll be home in a day or two. He drives. They hold him for a week, which gives the US time to arrange a Jordanian rendition flight to pick him up. He's held in Jordan for eight months. Then we send a CIA flight, pick him up in Jordan, send him to Bagram, and then we fly him to Guantanamo. That entire time, his family was bringing food and clothes to the local prison in, in Nouakchott, Mauritania. They're a poor family, and every day they were bringing him food and clothing. And Yadi, who's in Germany, that was, you know, he reported on November 21st, 2001 for questioning. The, ne the following October, Yadi is, picks up Der Spiegel in Germany. And there's an article about people with German connections who are in Guantanamo. And the, it ends with the paragraph about Mohammed Uld Slahi sitting in a wire cage in Guantanamo. And Yadi told me he was furious 
absolutely furious. And he wasn't furious at the United States. His reaction was to be furious at the kind of thieving local prison officials. <laughs> so he called his family, you know, on the phone. He's like, you never, you know, Mohammed was in Guantanamo and those, you know, bastard prison guys. And the family hung up the phone because they just were sure that they were being monitored. And he called back again and he just sort of laid into him again. It's those, you know, and they hung up again. But just like, you know, that just little, we never even went out of our minds to think about you know, the, the, the human cost of these things that we were talking about. This is enforced disappearance. This is at one of the highest order of human rights crimes. It's right up there with torture because it is torture, because it's torture for the family and it's torture for the individual to just deprive anybody of access to the legal process. You know, the, uh, and yet we knew that. We knew his story. We knew he'd plucked him and sent him to another country and yet we never bothered even as a country to say, what did that mean for his family, regardless of who he is? You know, and that's, you know, I think that we're just, what his book does is really for the first time, draws back that curtain, you know, in a way that actually allows people to engage with, with this. Because I think we're afraid. I think we've been very afraid of pulling back that curtain and hearing these stories. And he's got this remarkable voice and remarkable just kind of, equanimity and, 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 um, and real compassion and empathy with the people who are detaining him and a, and a real sense of forgiveness. And he lets us sort of begin this process that we've been pushing off for so long. I, I mean, we heard the quote from McCain at the beginning, it's not about them, it's about us. Um, so it's about us. Now McCain is making, trying to put all his energy into making sure that um, Guantanamo's uh, there and well occupied forever. Is Obama serious about this? Uh, I mean, w a lot of us have to ask. It's, it was pretty heartening in those first few weeks of his administration to hear that something which hadn't been a significant electoral campaign issue was one of his very first acts as president, promising that he'd get this thing shut. And then we start hearing from the press and from everybody else that like, well, you know, it's more complicated than he, he's the president of the United States. He's not a weak guy. Um, well, I mean, the, you know, it's the Obama administration that has fought this habeas. Of, why? Um, I don't know. You'd have to ask no, that. I mean, you're 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 at least <laughs> seeing something where they're saying out of one very out of one hand we want to close this, the president. but all they have to do in Mohamedou's case is stop fighting the habeas. And there's others like him, you know. Just stop fighting the habeas. That's why we have this petition at the ACLU for people to to tell the Department of the Defense stop fighting it. He could go home tomorrow. There. There are people who've been cleared for release for years, and we, we're we not uh, moving. I mean, is this pure we're politics? Is everybody afraid of a Willie Horton ad? No, where one I of these think, guys yeah, it, like, well, ends up sort of somehow implicated, and the other, and everybody gets to run against them because they haven't exhausted every exhausting way of keeping them around? I think that's, I think that's true in Nobody a way, but then, I think, the but then I think that, but the buck stops with us then, right? I mean, I think, you know, you said at the very beginning, we're all, we're all implicated in this in some very significant way. Why hasn't Obama closed Guantanamo? You know, the first answer is, well, the Republicans keep, you know, fighting back, right? And there's this new bill in the Senate Armed Services Committee well, called the, the Guantanamo. For, but where are the Democrats? And uh, but as you say, yes, there's a there's a level of political cowardice. It's like, well, if I vote for these things, you know, I may get voted out of office. But that means we're not giving them the message, right? They're afraid of us. And so I think, you know, ultimately today, at this point, you know, it's really up to us. It's up to I mean, the American people. They're not afraid people. of us. Sorry? They're not afraid they of us. Well, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Writ large. Yeah. Writ large. Yeah. I mean, right. the, you know, right. the American people need to, this is on us. These things have been done, you know. I think legitimately the people who carried out these policies inside of Guantanamo probably slept every night thinking that they were doing, they, they thought they were doing what we wanted them to do. I think that's probably true. And I think we need to say to them, you know, I think in some cases that's true. I think there was a level of fear and you know vindictiveness and everything that sort of propelled our d willful blindness. But at some point we need to say, okay, we're going to take responsibility for that too. But you know this cannot ha this cannot happen again. One last question for you, Nancy, and, and our time's up. But I just want to ask you: Is um, how hopeful you are that we'll uh, we might have him, if not on this stage, amongst us in the in the in the unchained world anytime in the near future? I think, and, and I had not believed this until I saw the impact of this book around the world, that there really is a chance we can get him out in 2015. Um, I really do believe that we will. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you both. Thank you both very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. August 2003 to December 2003. I still had nothing in my cell. Most of the time, I recited the Quran silently. The rest of the time, I was talking to myself and thinking over and over about my life and the worst case scenarios that could happen to me. I kept out counting the holes of the cage I was in. There are about 4,100 holes. I started to enrich my vocabulary. I took a paper and started to write words I didn't understand and redacted explained them to me. If there's anything positive about redacted, it's his rich vocabulary. <laughs> I don't remember asking him about a word he couldn't explain to me. English was his only real language, though he claimed to be able to speak Farsi. I wanted to learn French, but I hated the way they speak and I quit, he said. Redacted wants to see you in a couple of days, Redacted said. I was so terrified. At this point, I was just fine without his visit. He is welcome, I said. I started to go to the toilet relentlessly. My blood pressure went crazily high. I was wondering what the visit would be like, but thank God, the visit was much easier than what I thought. Redacted came, escorted by Redacted, he was, as always, practical and brief. I'm very happy with your cooperation. Remember when I told you that I preferred civilized conversations? I think you have provided 85% of what you know, but I'm sure you're going to provide the rest, he said, opening an ice bag with some juice. Oh, yeah, I'm also happy, I said, forcing myself to drink the juice just to act if I was normal. But I wasn't. I was like, 85% is a big step coming out of his mouth. Redacted advised me to keep cooperating. I brought you this present, he said, handing me a pillow. Yes, a pillow. I received the present with a fake overwhelming happiness, and not because I was dying to get a pillow. No, I took the pillow as a sign of the end of the physical torture. We have a joke back home about a man who stood bare naked on the street. When someone asked him, how can I help you? He replied, give me shoes. And that was exactly what was happening to me. All I needed was a pillow, but it was something. Alone in my cell, I kept reading the tag over and over. Gitmo, 2004 to 2005. The guards wanted to be baptized with the names of characters in the Star Wars movies. From now on, we are the redacted, and that's what you call us. <laughs> Your name is Pillow, redacted said. I eventually learned from the books that redacted are sort of good guys who fight against the forces of evil. So for the time being, I was forced to represent the forces of evil and the guards, the good guys. My job is to make you see the light, said Redacted, addressing me for the first time when he was watching me eating my meal. Guards were not allowed to talk to me or to each other, and I couldn't talk to them. But Redacted was not a by-the-book guy. He thought more than any other guard, and his goal was to make his country victorious. The means didn't matter. Yes, sir, I answered, without even understanding what he meant. I thought about the literal sense of the light I hadn't seen in a long time, and I believed he wanted to get me cooperating so I could see the daylight. But redacted meant the figurative sense. Redacted always yelled at me and scared me, but he never hit me. He illegally interrogated me several times, which is why I called him Redacted. <laughs> redacted wanted me to confess to many wild theories he heard the interrogators talking about. Furthermore, he wanted to gather knowledge about terrorism and extremism. I think his dream in life was to become an interrogator. 
What a hell of a dream. <laughs> Redacted is an admitted Republican and hates the Democrats, especially Bill Clinton. He doesn't believe that the US should interfere in other countries' business and instead should focus more on internal issues. <laughs> but if any country or group attacks the US, it should be destroyed ruthlessly. <laughs> Fair enough, I said. I just wanted him to stop talking. <laughs> he is the kind of guy who never stops when he gets started. Gosh, he gave me an earache. <laughs> when Redacted first started talking to me, I refused to answer because all I was allowed to say was, yes, sir, no, sir, need medics, need interrogators. But he wanted a conversation with me. You are my enemy, Redacted said. Yes, sir. So let's talk enemy to enemy, Redacted said. He opened my cell and offered me a chair. Redacted did the talking for the most part. He was talking about how great the US is and how powerful. America is this, American is that. We Americans are so and so. I was just wondering and nodding slightly. Every once in a while I confirmed that I was paying attention. Yes sir, really? Oh, I didn't know. You're right, I know. During our conversations he sneakily tried to make me admit to things I really hadn't done. What was your role in September 11th? I didn't participate in September 11th. Bullshit, he screamed madly. I realized it would be no good for my life to look innocent, at least for the time being. So I said, I was working for Al-Qaeda and Radio Telecom. <laughs> he seemed happier with the lie. What was your rank, he kept digging. I would be a lieutenant. I know you've been in the US, he tricked me. This is a big one and I couldn't possibly lie about it. I could vaguely swallow having done a lot of things in Afghanistan because uh, Americans cannot confirm or disconfirm it. But the Americans could check right away whether or not I had been in their own country. I really haven't been in the US, I answered, though I was ready to change my answer when I had no options. You've been in Detroit, he sardonically smiled. I smiled back. I really haven't. <laughs> uh, Guantanamo, April, uh, uh, April 2004, April 2005. Before prison, I, I didn't know the difference between a pawn and the rear end of a knight, nor was I really a big gamer. But I found in chess a very interesting game, especially the fact that a prisoner has total control over his pieces, which gives him some confidence back. When I started playing, I played very aggressively in order to let out my frustration, which was not really very good chess playing. <coughs> Going was my first mentor and going beat me in my first game ever. But the next game was mine and so were all the other games that followed. Chess, chess is a game of strategy, art, and mathematics. It takes deep thinking and there is no luck involved. You get rewarded or punished for your actions. Boing! Brought me a chess board so I could play against myself. When the guards noticed my chessboard, they all wanted to play me. And when they started to play me, they always won. The strongest among the guards was going. He taught me how to control the center. Moreover, going brought me some literature, which helped me decidedly in honing my skills. After that, the guards had no chance to defeat me. That is not the way I taught you to play chess, going, commented angrily when I won a game. Well, what should I do? You should build a strategy and, and organize your attack. That's why the fucking Arabs never succeed. 
Why don't you just play the board, I wondered. <laughs> Chess is not just a game, he said. Well, just imagine you're playing against a computer. Do I, do I look like a computer to you? No. The next game, I try to build a strategy in order to let boing win. Now you understand how chess must be played, I c he commented. <laughs> I knew going had issues dealing with defeat, and so I didn't enjoy playing him because I didn't feel comfortable practicing my newly acquired knowledge. Going believes there are two kinds of people, white Americans, and the rest of the world. White Americans are smart and better than anybody. I always try to explain things to him by saying, for instance, well, if I were you or, or if you were me. But he got angry and said, don't you ever dare to compare me with you or compare any American with you. I was shocked, but I did as he said. After all, I didn't have to compare myself with anybody. Going hated the rest of the world, especially the Arabs, the Jews, the French, the Cubans, <laughs> and others. <laughs> the only country he mentioned positively was England. After one game of chess with him, he flipped the board. Fuck your nigger chess. You play Jewish chess. Gitmo, 2004 to 2005. In Redacted, the US Army released the first letter from my family. It was sent through the International Committee of the Red Cross. My family wrote it months before, in July 2003. It had been 815 days since I was kidnapped from my house had, and had lost contact with my family completely I had been sending many letters to my family since I arrived in Cuba, but to no avail. In Jordan, I was forbidden even to send a letter. Redacted was the one who handed me that historical piece of paper, which read, Redacted, in the name of God, the most merciful, peace be with you and God's, mer and God's mercy. After my greeting, I inform you of my well-being and that of the rest of your family. We hope that you are the same way. My health situation is okay. I still keep up with my schedule with the doctors. I feel I am getting better. And the family is okay. As I mentioned, everybody sends his greeting to you. <laughs> Beloved son, as of now, we have received three letters from you. And this is our second reply. The neighbors are well, and they send their greetings. At the end of this letter, I renew my greeting. Peace be with you, your mom. I couldn't believe that after all I had been through, I was holding a letter from my mom. I smelled the odor of a letter that had touched the hand of my mom and the other members of my beloved family. The emotions in my heart were mixed. I didn't know what to do, laugh or cry. I ultimately ended up doing both. I kept reading the short message over and over. I knew it was for real, not like the fake one I got last time. But I couldn't respond to the letter because I was still not allowed to see the ICRC. Meanwhile, I kept getting books in English that I enjoyed reading, most of them Western literature. I still remember one book called The Catcher in the Rye that made me laugh until my stomach hurt. It was such a funny book. I tried to keep my laughter as low as possible, pushing it down, but the guards felt something. Are you crying, said one of them. No, I I'm all right, I responded. It was my first unofficial laughter in the ocean of tears. Since interrogators are not professional comedians, most of the humor they came up with was a bunch of lame, joke, uh, lame jokes that really didn't make me laugh. But I would always force an official smile.
Gitmo, 2004 to 2005. Redacted led me outside the building. I saw Redacted looking away from me, shy that I see his face. If you deal with somebody for so long behind a face cover, that is how you know him, Redacted. But now if he, Redacted, takes off the face cover, you have to deal with his features, and that is a completely different story for both sides. I could tell the guards were uncomfortable to show me their faces. Redacted put it bluntly, if I catch you looking at me, I'm gonna hurt you. Don't worry, I'm not dying to see your face. Through time, I had built a perception about the way everybody looked, but imagination was far from reality. Redacted prepared a small table with a modest breakfast. I was scared as hell. For one, Redacted never took me outside the building. And for two, I was not used to my guards' new faces. I tried to act casually, but my shaking gave me away. What's wrong with you? Redacted asked. I'm very nervous. I'm not used to this environment. But it's meant for your good, Redacted said. Redacted was a very official person. If Redacted interrogates you, she does it officially. And if Redacted eats with you, Redacted does it as part of Redacted job. And that was cool. I was just waiting for the breakfast to be done so I could go back to my cell because Redacted had brought me the movie King Henry V by Shakespeare. Redacted, may I watch the movie more than once, I asked. I'm afraid I'm not going to understand it right away at first. Yes, you can watch it as many times as you wish. When Redacted brought the TV, Redacted briefed the guards to let me watch the movie only once, and then the party was over. You're allowed to watch your movie only once, but as far as we're concerned, you can watch it as many times as you wish, as long as you don't tell your interrogator about it. We really don't care, Redacted told me later. No, if Redacted said so, I'm going to stick with it. I'm not going to cheat, I told him. <laughs> Gitmo, 2004, 2005. But I did ask for one thing. Redacted, can I keep my water bottle in my cell and drink whenever I choose? I was just tired of the lack of sleep, and as soon as I closed my eyes, the heavy metal door opened, and I had to drink another bottle of water. I knew Redacted was not the right person to ask to take the initiative. Redacted had literally been following the orders of Redacted. But to my surprise, Redacted came the next day and briefed the gods that the water bottle now belonged to my cell. You cannot imagine how happy I was to be able to decide the time and the amount of water I could drink. People who have never had, have never been in such a situation cannot really appreciate the freedom of drinking water whenever they want, however much they want. Then in July 2004, I found a copy of the Holy Koran in my box of laundry. When I saw the Holy Koran beneath the clothes, I felt bad thinking I had to steal it in in order to save it. But I took the Koran to my cell, and nobody ever asked me why I did it. Nor did I bring it up on my own. I had been forbidden all kinds of religious rituals, so I figured a copy of the Koran in my cell would not have made my interrogators too happy. More than that, lately the religious issue had become very delicate. The Muslim chaplain of Gitmo was arrested, and another Muslim soldier was charged with treason. Oh yes, treason. Many Arabic and religious books were banned, and books teaching the English language were also banned. I sort of understood religious books being banned, but why English learning books, I asked Redacted. Because detainees pick up the language quickly and understand the guards. That's so communist, I said. <laughs> Gitmo, 2004-2005. My job is to help your rehabilitation, one of my guards told me in the summer of 2004. The government realized that I was deeply injured and needed some, some real rehab. From the moment he started to work as my guard in July 2004, redacted related to me right. In fact, he hardly talked to anybody beside me. 
He used to put his mattress right in front of my cell door, and we started to talk about all kinds of topics like old friends. We talked about history, culture, politics, religion, women, everything but current events. The guards were taught that I was a detainee who would try to outsmart them and learn current events from them. But the guards are my witnesses. I didn't try to outsmart, outsmart anybody, nor was I interested in current events at the time because they only made me sick. Before Redacted left, he brought me a couple of souvenirs and with Redacted and Redacted, dedicated a copy of Steve Martin's The Pleasure of My Company to me. Redacted wrote, Pill, over the past 10 months, I have gotten to know you and we have become friends. I wish you good luck and I'm sure I will think of you often. Take care of yourself. Redacted wrote, Pillow, good luck with your situation. Just remember, Allah always has a plan. I hope you think of us as more than just guards. I think we all became friends. Redacted wrote, April 19, 2005, Pillow, for the past 10 months, I have done my damnedest to maintain a detainee guard relationship. At times, I have failed. It is almost impossible not to like a character like yourself. Keep your faith. I'm sure it will guide you in the right direction. I used to debate faith with one of the new guards. Redacted was raised as a conservative Catholic. He was not really religious, but I could tell he was his family's boy. I kept trying to convince him that the existence of God is a logical necessity. I don't believe in anything unless I can see it, he told me. After you've seen something, you don't need to believe it, I responded. For instance, if I tell you I have a cold Pepsi in my fridge, either you believe it or you don't. But after seeing it, you know, and you don't need to believe me. Personally, I do have faith, and I picture him and these other guards as good friends if we could meet under different circumstances. May God guide them and help make them help them make the right choices in life. Hi, I'm Beth Weinstein. I'm Deputy Director of Public Programs at Penn. Um, I, um, I just wanted to extend some thanks. Um, thank you to Theater 80 for coming to the rescue and um, providing such a great space. To the Culture Project for all your help. To Avram Ludwig for all your help. Yes. Um, thank you to the readers for their incredible generosity and for their flexibility with the snowstorm. Um, to Nancy for coming back to New York, for Philip Gorovich, and um, to Larry. This event was a particular, it was an honor to work on this event. Um, I have worked with Larry for seven years, um, and I just so admire your, your commitment to the truth and to human rights and freedom of expression. So I know everyone at Penn joins me in, in saying thank you. We love you. <laughs> um, I wanted to just let you know that the book is, um, is for sale. There's a stamp with Mohamedou's signature. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. Um, I, I've read it. I expected a compelling story, and I, I didn't expect it to be written so beautifully. Some of the lines have really stayed inside of me and haunted me. So I, I really hope that each of you will buy a copy. And there's also a copy of The Torture Report, Larry's, another one of Larry's books. Um, I wanted to let you know that this is part of an ongoing conversation that we're, we're having. Penn is really committed to engaging with these kinds of topics. We have an event on the uh, 19th at FIAF, um, kind of exploring um, political satire in uh, the wake of the Charlie Hebdo uh, massacre. And um, we're also doing other kinds of events. We have Amanda Palmer at um, the Ace Hotel on March 2nd. So we really hope that you'll join our community and. Um, Thank you very much for coming out, and thank you to all the readers. <laughs>